chairman of the Lanka Rain, uh, Lanka Rain Water Harvesting Forum and currently an executive uh, or board member. I'm happy to see uh, all the speakers are from Bhutan, right? Why I'm saying this is I, I really have a, a great liking to Bhutan, right? We have been there twice, once on uh, work and once as a tourist. And uh, your country is uh, one place that you can find pristine water and forest resources, which I was really, really fascinated. And also, uh, I must tell you that I'm a great believer of your fourth king's doctrine on uh, gross national happiness. And that's, uh, that's, that's a real cherry on the pie, and I really admire that. Okay, so the today's webinar is uh, increasing resilience of communities of, or to water security to get secure water. Uh, we have uh, three speakers, as we all know, on the total duration, as uh, Th uh, Danushi was mentioning just now, uh, we will have about one and a half hours, and therefore uh, 10 to 15 or 10 to 12 minutes from uh, each presentation. And uh, then we'll go on for going to uh, questions and answers. I, we have three presentations, and I believe that all of you have got the questions that were sent by Thanu, uh, Danushi. Uh, I, we, how we will try to do is, uh, once we finish the presentations, we will try to see whether we can address the questions. There are 10 questions. Uh, if you have gone through them, there are 10 questions that have come through. And you can really see at least three questions, one, two, and 10 are uh, dealing with the same subject, like uh, Bhutan traditional knowledge and how to integrate that with the current situation of water resources. And number three and four are more on community engagement and ownership, right? Uh, six and seven needs detailed answering, which I don't know whether we will have time to go into all that. And uh, question nine is more on a technical issue. So let's see how much we can uh, address all these things. And... Uh, after that, if there are any other questions which comes up right now during our webinar in the chat box, we will see whether we can uh, whether we can address all that. Right. Having said that, uh, can I now invite uh, Mrs. Sonam Pem to give her presentation? But uh, before that, let me give us short brief about uh, Sonam. Sonam is a social development worker currently serving as the executive director of Tariana Foundation. Sonam started her career as a program officer managing community development projects. <clears throat> During her career, she has managed over 30 community project development projects. Sonam received a certificate of excellence from government of Bhutan for outstanding performance in implementing the government's most extensive poverty reduction program. She was also a member of the first core committee of the CSO, Bhutan Civil Society Network, and the gender expert group for former National Commission of Women and Children. Okay, from there, let me hand it over to Sonam. You can start off with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Rajendra. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Sarnet for giving Tarana this opportunity, um, solely for Tarana to present in this uh, webinar. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on water, but I wanted to take this opportunity to talk, introduce the foundation and um, inform all our audiences on where water lies in the larger scheme of what Tarana does. And I have two uh, technical experts who will talk about the subject matter, but I will be basically uh, introducing the foundation and what else we do uh, beyond water security. So Tarana Foundation, we celebrated our 21st anniversary this year. So we are almost 22 years in service. And uh, we were founded, we are founded by Her Majesty the Queen Mother, who when she was the queen, used to be the patron for environment and agriculture. In that capacity, Her Majesty traveled throughout the country on foot, we're talking about times when most of our rural communities did not have road connectivity, did not have electricity, did not have all the modern amenities. So that was the time when Her Majesty traveled throughout the country and came across many isolated communities which required additional support. So Tarayana was born out of necessity. 
And our vision is a happy and prosperous Bhutan. And we, our motto is to make the vulnerable, serve the, rural, the vulnerable uh, communities, help themselves. Not, not just help them, but enable them to help themselves. And as I said, we are a grassroots CSO. In Bhutan, there are about uh, 57 civil society organization. And we are one of the largest and one of the uh, oldest. And our focus is uh, mainly on poverty reduction because we are working with the last mile. And as I said, we um, exist to bridge the gap between the larger national initiative and the local grassroots initiatives. We have field officers on the ground. So having our foots on the ground makes a lot of difference, which is why we've been able to do a lot of impactful work in the rural communities. So I wanted to talk about this holistic development model that we have developed ourselves working with many communities at different times. So this model, we developed it because uh, we realized that the government services were provided on a sector-based approach where one sector may not really look at what the other sector is doing. Whereas on the ground, the communities issues are not cannot be segregated like this is health this is education and you know, this is um agriculture so that's why we have this integrative holistic model whereby we focus on housing need first so we make sure that that particular community has at least a proper roof over their head then address their water and sanitation needs food and nutrition security skills training then develop enterprises, renewable energy and environment. We also empower youth in these communities and eventually enable access to credit for these communities. So for Tarayana, the, the measurement of how uh, we would consider a community empowered uh, is when they're able to access credit from not having a basic proper roof over the head, now being able to access credit, that is the graduating point. Uh, in our measurement. And we have three broad programs, social, economic, and environment and climate. Um, so from the three programs, this water initiative that we undertake is under the environment and climate. So we have many other programs. I'll not talk about it in the interest of time. So in the environment and climate, what we do is all the climate change adaptation and mitigation activities we do rainwater harvesting, we do spring shed management, we do all the renewable energy. This is a micro hydro uh, a pilot project we undertook in a very remote community. Then we promote fuel efficient uh, stoves, solar dryers, land management, electric fencing, solar fencing. So these are the community led uh, climate action activities that we undertake. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have our colleagues who live and work in the rural communities. So this really sets apart from any other organizations, including the government, because we can really spend, uh, invest a lot of time in each community where we get to understand the community nuance and therefore are able to respond to their needs in the most effective way. So Tarena also doesn't spread ourselves too thin uh, we select the poorest of the poor community in each um, block, uh, panchayat, and there we um, implement this holistic community development. So that way we're able to lift these uh, communities in poverty, out of poverty at a faster pace. And apart from all the community development initiatives, we also do these activities, which are very important. And uh, we have uh, our sister concerns. So we have a microfinance, which again uh, grew out of necessity because communities would come to us requesting us to lend them money once they have the skills, when they, once they have the basic needs in place, that's, that's when they came requesting us to lend them money. And we had to start a microfinance, um, microfinance bank because their access to credit was very limited from the other financial institutes. So we also have a Tarana Rural Crafts. That's a different entity that um, helps uh, market the products from our rural communities. So through our skills development uh, programs, they start income generating activities, mostly from the traditional crafts. But again, 
uh, access to market was very limited. We we're talking about bringing their product on a horseback for three days to the roadhead and then bringing it to the market. So we started from those times and today we have evolved. Then we have a research center that carries out um, action research and it also does assessment of all the Tarayana's activities, initiatives on the ground and uh, points direction to the foundation on where to go next. So this is a very important arm of Tarayana and we have a museum that is also under the patronage of our uh, founding president. And this is some facts and figures, uh, tangible outputs of our last more than little more than two decades uh, service. And yeah, this is a brief introduction to the foundation. And I will be um, responding to some of the questions later. Uh, I would like now, like to now hand it over to Mr. Rajendra. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sonam. That was really quick, and I think you really got to the point. Uh, okay, so uh, can we go on to the next presentation? But by Dr. Sange Doji. Uh, let me give a brief uh, bio and description about uh, Sanjay Do Dr. Sanjay jo Doji. Is a tech uh, Sanjay Doji is a technical director, program specialist at the Tariana Foundation with expertise in conservation biology, special science, climate change, forestry, and community-based project management. Dr. Doji has over 15 years of experience working in various capacities with the Bhutan government sectors before joining Tariana Foundation in, in June 2024. Over to Dr. Jo Doji, please. Yeah, it's all yours, Doctor. Hi, uh, good morning, afternoon, and e evening to everyone. Uh, I would like to talk about the, the impact of uh, climate change on the water resources in Bhutan. So, uh, as you know, Bhutan uh, is located in the eastern Himalayas. So, it's, I, think, uh, I mean, like, uh, it's actually the, the water governance or water management or whatever is uh, governed by the, the the three latitudinal gradient. Uh, we have the Northern Highland, uh, High Himalayas, dry, uh, inner dry valleys and humid, uh, which actually influence the water uh, water system in Bhutan. So, and uh, as you know, like uh, the, as everywhere, like, Everywhere in the Himalayas, Bhutan is among the countries that's most impacted by the climate change, uh, with the like uh, expected like increase of uh, 2.1 degrees Celsius over the last 70 years, and uh, and uh, some of the figures that uh, like the data from Bhutan the meteorological uh, data shows that Bhutan the temperature in Bhutan has increased by 1.02 degrees Celsius over the last 27 years, with the average uh, annual rise of like uh, 0 0.0378 uh, degrees Celsius. So we are uh, really experiencing the uh, the rise of temperature and also the change in the pattern of uh, precipitations. Like uh, for instance, some areas where there's uh, already a lot of rain, we are experiencing a lot of rain, like uh, one place in the western Bhutan, in the north western Bhutan, a place called Grasa, where the, we do get a lot of rain, but then because of the, I think, uh, change in precipitation, we are getting more rain, if you see the graph in the first one. And then in some areas, uh, especially in the southern belt, like uh, mid-southern belt, like uh, we are experiencing uh, dire uh, there uh, uh, precipitations like uh, lesser rain over the last uh, uh, 20, uh, 27 years. So uh, there's a change in uh, precipitation pattern in the country. And also, uh, especially with the snow cover, we are experiencing uh, have experienced a lot of uh, melting of snow cover, losing the our uh, glacial mountains and snow covered uh, to the rising temperature. So 
uh, uh, if you look at the pictures from the, one of the highest mountain in the Western Bhutan, so there was a lot of snow cover changes over from 1983 to uh, 2009. So it was the pictures that was uh, taken by uh, uh, one of the research called uh, Tsukihara in the, yeah, so over the years and uh, shows clearly shows. And uh, this was not actually only proven by science or experience by also, but also even the villages, the herders and the, and the people who live in the high mountains have observed this. So I may like, like to sh share a video that I've uh, captured uh, when I interviewed a local people just three weeks ago when I went to the high high land, uh, high mountain areas and uh, I interviewed the uh, herders and they uh, shared me their experience. So just as an example, can't see the video. Uh, can you, you can't see the video? No, the video is no, not coming no. on. We sure oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Oh, now, okay. yeah, okay. now, okay. now, now it's there. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah, the translations are going on. So yeah, uh, this was about uh, the 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 experience shared by the uh, local communities living in the highlands. So they have uh, observed the change in weather pattern, the melting of snows, and also the the, the precipitations. Uh, they, they said that they receive uh, an excessive uh, uh, rain sometimes, but sometimes never uh, receive any snowfalls or like in the past, or even if they receive it. Like, this is very less. And uh, so similarly, uh, uh, all over Bhutan, we have uh, we are, uh, experiencing increased vulnerability to natural disasters due to the climate change. Uh, if you see like hailstorm, windstorm, earthquake, or, or fire, flood, and uh, etc. due to the climate change. And uh, if I um, share some of my experience uh, from my on research when I was uh, uh, working the uh, Department of Forest and Park Services. So uh, I've uh, done some interviewed, uh, some research and interviewed the local communities living in the biological corridors inside and outside the biological corridors. And the people also uh, say the same thing. They have like, uh, uh, exp they have uh, experienced, they said they have experienced the uh, increase in rainfall and increase in temperature and also sometimes more duration of snow uh, snowfall or change in phenology and also some uh, migratory species, uh, new species observed in the villages and uh, uh, affected by uh, different weather conditions and uh, yeah, the natural disasters and also 
uh, other research uh, paper that I published. So like we have also uh, found that uh, some of the species are moving up towards uh, like species like uh, elephant or the golden lungu, even the tigers and the habitats are changing and moving up, shifting up due to the increase in temperature and over the next 60 or or 50 years, or uh, yeah, 30, 50 years, so probably you see a lot of uh, uh, shift in the vegetations and the habitat of these uh, uh, wildlife and uh, species migrate, migration towards the north, northern side. Uh, uh, however, uh, when it comes to the water of Bhutan in the, in the world, uh, actually Bhutan has been uh, identified as a very low stress uh, country in terms of water uh, risks. But then, the, so this is mainly due to because the, the per capita of uh, water has been like, uh, in Bhutan is very high because uh, we have a lot of water uh, in, in, but then the per capita for the water usable water is very low. Because I think uh, this is basically most of the water or the uh, water flows in the term, in, in the form of river that is not like uh, people cannot really capture it for the human or domestic or economic use. So that's why I think uh, we have a uh, uh, issue with the water, but then however it is uh, noted as a, a low risk because in terms of the water uh, per capita. And uh, we, uh, we used uh, water in the uh, various forms, and uh, so like uh, uh, only one percent of the the fresh water we have is is used and only and uh, uh, basically uh, this is like six it's six percent of the uh, this is used for agriculture, uh, which actually contributes uh, fifteen percent of the GDP, and then also. We use some water for industries and uh, tourism, and then uh, for the drinking and other domestic pro product. Uh, dom domestic use uh, is like four point five percent of the remaining. And and uh, in Bhutan, the spring dominates the main water source uh, with uh, some six point six percent, followed by the streams, uh, which is about like 20 percent, and the rivers. For the uh, water water supply, uh, so as I was saying, like uh, the water is mainly uh, used for the drinking. The, so drinking, uh, actually, the fresh water that's like uh, uh, we the, from the spring and all the three main three uh, sources are used for nine, like some some six point nine percent is used for drinking and. Uh, about 12% is used for irrigation and rest for uh, commercial drinking irrigation and put other potential untapped water uses. However, uh, because as I was saying that because of the climate change and land use changes and also the uh, the lack of technology and other other factors, we are experiencing the drying up of the springs uh, in the country. So. Uh, uh, we have experienced over the last, like, uh, uh, this was a survey uh, done by the Royal Government of Bhutan uh, from the Watershed, uh, Watershed Division. Uh, it's now it's called as a Department of Water. So they have found that uh, almost 60% of the springs in Bhutan, uh, uh, sorry, 37% 37 uh, 37 of the springs in Bhutan are dying and almost 2%, 1.8% has dried up in, in the country. And basically, uh, as I was saying, like uh, some places like Tagana, where the, we received the lesser drier land, uh, rainfall or the precipitation. Pre 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 uh, because of that, I think uh, Tagana have the one of the highest uh, drying spring, springs in the country. Uh, the main causes of the drying of the springs are mainly because of the uh, people uh, uh, think that is because of the climate change and also because of the forest degradation and deforestation. I think uh, we haven't done much actually in-depth uh, research on that, but then I think it's from the people's perception uh, from the interview uh, by the Department of uh, Water. So 
things that uh, climate change is one of the main causes for the drying of the springs uh, or the water sources in Bhutan, and then followed by forest degradation and deforestation and other anthropogenic uh, activities like land use changes and overgrazing. Uh, because of that, uh, people because of the because of that like because of the uh, drying of springs or the dried springs, uh, uh, people are abandoning the the villages. For instance, this is the this is the village uh, just above my hometown where like people have migrated from their village uh, to the to the lower area because the, the water sources, all the water sources in the village have dried up. That was because I remember like as a child, people in those uh, village, in this village, mainly depend their livelihood on the sale of illegal extraction and sale of illegal timber, supply of illegal timber to the lower, lower uh, valleys, uh, people living in the lower valleys. And also, uh, I remember uh, the lot of uh, uh, forest fire, the freaking uh, forest fire in the places, and then they have built a road uh, above the village over, uh, I think, uh, in last 20 years, 20 years ago. And so I think these are all the factors that actually caused the the, the dying of the spring. So people have uh, my. People are migrating. I think this is just an example, but I think uh, we are also experiencing this similar trend in other parts of the countries where the, the springs are drying up or either died up. So that's why people are facing the water shortage and uh, yeah, so they're abandoning their villages. And uh, this is also a, a picture that uh, I just captured uh, from a uh, day before yesterday. I just returned from a uh, uh, a place called Tagala, uh, Tagapela uh, in Tagana Zong district, where like uh, they've done some water testing in one of the uh, urban areas there and uh, uh, semi urban area. And uh, we found that most of the spring water, uh, spring water supply sources are actually contaminated by uh, and also contains uh, high pH value and. Uh, Acidic and uh, probably this is this must be affected by the uh, polluted by the uh, sewage uh, unmanaged sewage product uh, sewage system and also the waste disposal and also the land conversion uh, in the in the area. So uh, these are some of the uh, imminent threats that uh, people are facing in terms of water uh, uh, apart from the climate change. So. Uh, in short, I think uh, to manage uh, all this uh, and also mitigate or adapt to, to the climate change and land use changes, I think uh, we really need uh, water managed, proper water management system in the country and also uh, technology interventions and policy inter interventions are recommended. Uh, as I was saying, like, though we have a very high per capita water in the country, but um, because the, most of the water flow in the lower valley as a river, but then most of our villages are located on the hilltops. So uh, we cannot really potentially trap those water. And that's why like most of the water uh, sources, we depend uh, dependent uh, on the, the spring water sources uh, that actually uh, fed by either rain or snow. So uh, uh, in that way, we really need a, a uh, the proper water management and technology and policy interventions to uh, sustainably manage our water resources in the country. Uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. And uh, I think uh, I, I'll hand over to my next presenter. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zoji. Can I now invite uh, the third presentation by Karma Uden, please, and let me uh, let me give a brief bio about Karma. Karma Uden is a program officer at Tarana Foundation. She is managing programs related to climate change and the environment. She has been working for eight long years in projects which aims to promote human wildlife coexistence, secure water resources for local communities and development, and implement and implement sustainable livelihood strategies 
at the grassroots level. Udin's professional career spans from being an ICT manager with Green Bhutan Corporation Limited and project support officer at uh, Red Plus Readiness Preparedness Project at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. Okay, over to you, uh, Karma Udain, please. Okay, uh, am I audible? Yeah, okay. you are. Go uh, ahead. Thank you, Rajendra, for the yeah. introduction. Uh, so basically, today my presentation is uh, mainly on the intervention of uh, spring shed intervention uh, that we have implemented in one of our project sites uh, in Paro. I'll be talking more about our uh, implementation. Next. I cannot move my slide. Okay. So, Spring Shed Development Initiative in Bhutan. The main objective of this Spring Shed Development uh, is to combine the spring water depletion using nature based solution. And some of the key action uh, involved in the Spring Shed Development uh, are this firstly, we conduct this hydrogeological survey. Uh, where we, uh, in this hydrogeological survey, we assess the water source and uh, uh, conduct field-based uh, geological data collection and mapping. After the hydrogeological survey, uh, we uh, do this uh, uh, mapping of uh, potential recharge area for the particular spring. And after the uh, all this assessment and after identifying the potential recharge area uh, to implement uh, this uh, to implement, we built uh, this uh, rainwater harvesting structure to harvest the rainwater in this uh, potential recharge area zone. So uh, in this process, what we do is we engage the community from the very beginning, from the very beginning to, to the end of this uh, activity. And in the process, we form water user group uh, for equitable resource management and, uh, and to reduce human wildlife conflict. Uh, we also uh, build the capacity of the community in the process. And the main uh, objective of the spin uh, development initiative for long run is to revive the drying springs in uh, springs and to enhance the community resilience uh, in the face of climate change and to ensure sustainable water management. So as we can see that uh, in our national newspaper, there are uh, news covered that uh, many of our springs are drying up, uh, mainly due to climate change. And also, as Dr. mentioned, uh, or mentioned that uh, in one of the assessments carried out by the Watershed Management Division uh, in 2021, uh, there are around uh, 7,399 water sources uh, uh, they have identified, but out of which uh, uh, 69 has already dried up and uh, uh, 1,856 uh, are in the process of drying up. And this study was conducted in uh, 2021. And in these three years, uh, uh, we never know that, again, how many springs have dried up. So the only solution as of now is uh, we found out is that uh, there is a need for adaptation, which we currently implement, which is spring shed management uh, in spring shed management. So spring shed management is uh, uh, basically a holistic approach, uh, which not only seeks to revive the drying springs, but also to enhance the local community capacity in the field of this climate change. Uh, as I really explained earlier in the previous slide, uh, in spring shed, uh, we uh, dig these uh, trenches and pits uh, at the identified uh, recharge uh, area uh, to harvest the uh, rainwater. And in the process, the, there is a formation of water user group in the community and implementation of ecosystem-based adaptation to, uh, to protect the water resources and reduce human wildlife conflict. So if I narrow down my presentation, uh, I would like to, uh, so, uh, this is the project uh, site that we have implemented the Spring Shed uh, Development Initiative, uh, uh, village named Sali Village in Dogar Block uh, in Paro District. And 
as you can see that in the Google Earth, these are our project beneficiaries. So for the two spring, there's a two spring named Sang A and B in this project, in this village. So when we visited the community in 2021, uh, what we saw was uh, uh, the community was saying that the uh, springs were drying up and uh, there's uh, no uh, enough water for agriculture, uh, agriculture as compared to previous year. And uh, also uh, when we visited the site, we found out that there's no proper water storage distribution. And also during the consultation, what we uh, observed was uh, the community lacked the knowledge on water management. And also there was informal uh, water user group, which was, uh, they, actually there was no water user group, but uh, there was uh, like informal, uh, this uh, collection of uh, money, but not in the proper, uh, proper uh, the water user group was not in a proper place. So what actually we did was we co-created this nature-based solution where we uh, we met um, the community member, uh, community member, and uh, we did this uh, uh, we did come this consultation and resource mapping, so that we know what is the real problem. After identifying the real uh, problem and issue, so what we did was we. Uh, we did this assessment, uh, spring sheet assessment uh, for the spring, spring, and it took around maybe six months uh, to do this uh, this assessment. And after finding the uh, recharge area for the spring, uh, what we did was uh, we uh, we again went to the community and meet the, the community member and we uh, disseminate our findings that uh, this is your spring and your recharge area falls under this area and you need to take care of the recharge area uh, by uh, digging trenches and all. So we basically we went there to uh, disseminate the findings and also uh, to design this uh, intervention. So before uh, uh, implementing the project, what we did was we appeased the local deities, as we can see in the picture, we appeased uh, the local deities, and in the, uh, after this uh, intervention, uh, we uh, built the capacity of the community by teaching them how to measure water quality, by teaching them how to measure this discharge of the spring, and also involving them from the very beginning uh, of the activity till the end, we taught them the low cost water filtration method, uh, how to this filter, uh, how to keep your water clean. So we made this low, we taught them how to make this low cost water filtration, as you can see in the picture. And also uh, we uh, formed this uh, water user group uh, by creating bylaws, by opening the saving account uh, in the community. And so we, it's a kind of, we revived this uh, water user group, which was informal. And lastly, we did this uh, digging of trenches in the, this recharge zone. So as we, you can see that uh, the, this is a before and after scenario. After scenario, the changes, the changes after the intervention, up, the upscaling of our learning and uh, as per the local leaders uh, in that village they really want to upscale uh, upscale this kind of project in the nearby village and with the help of this department of water uh, we installed a hobo data log logger uh, to monitor the rainfall data of the particular spring so in this slide uh, 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 you all can see that uh, the trenches been dug in the recharge area and uh, they, there's two springs, some A and B, and this is our intervention area. And uh, in intervention area that, we, as we can see, the wooden tools or uh, chamber built uh, to collect this water, collect water, and inside this wooden chamber, we installed this uh, traditional water filtration method to ensure clean water. So for more information, you all can visit this nature-based solution website uh, to know about the intervention.
So this is the, the closer picture of our intervention. Uh, the first picture was captured uh, for, with the help of the drone. Uh, drone inside this uh, wooden chamber, you, wooden chamber, you all can see this uh, simple uh, low cost water filtration method installed. So what we felt was the, the benefit of the project was uh, there was an active community engagement from the beginning of the uh, this activity. And uh, there's a sense of uh, this community ownership and accountability. And uh, this intervention is very accessible, simple, and easy to adapt and maintain by community members. And also the integration of traditional knowledge and practice, uh, uh, low cost, environment friendly, and sustainable. So in conclusion, uh, I'd like to state that Bhutan, uh, the, the spring shed management strategies are very critical uh, for ensuring this water security in the face of climate change. And we need this uh, continued adaptation and community involvement uh, for this uh, sustainable water resources. And uh, it is very important for all the stakeholders to come together and collaborate to enhance the water resilience. Uh, what is in Bhutan? So this is my presentation. Thank you. Please follow us on our website, Facebook, LinkedIn, and all. Thank you very much, uh, Karma Udin. That was a very interesting presentation about uh, community participation in uh, water management in hill terrains of uh, Bhutan. In fact, we have uh, come to the end of all presentations. We are much ahead of time, which means we have enough time to go into questions. Now, uh, as I was discussing at the beginning, we have a set of 10 questions in front of us. Uh, I would like to get your, your knowledge or not uh, your opinion on this. Because uh, if we do we go one by one, we have 10, I mean, we can, I mean, of course, uh, all these questions are for the presenters. Uh, or do we uh, lump them in some order and try to address uh, questions like that? Uh, what is your opinion on that? Uh, Tanuja or Danushi or oh, anyone oh. else? Uh, already uh, so if there are questions uh, coming immediately like there is a raised hand from Shahadat uh, so then we go like we we, we can take a mix uh, depending on uh, and then maybe go to the uh, the questions that have already directed after Shahadat's question maybe okay what's yeah yeah Shahadat can you come in please can you join in and what's, what's your question and whom are you directing your question to? Thank you very much for the presentations. So actually it's very interesting for us. Like we are now focusing on the sustainable solutions for water management here in this region, like the South Asian. So actually rainwater harvesting and rainwater use, reuse of this water is very uh, indigenous practices from a long time. So actually I have uh, to learn uh, many things from your presentations and for Bhutan and their local practices. So do you have practice any um, capacity building or awareness raising for local people like uh, any manuals which we have supposed to do like a local manual for Bhutan? If uh, you have, then can you share with us? It will be very helpful for us to use this indigenous learners for Bangladesh. I'm from Bangladesh and I'm also working with some uh, water resources engineering here, like for water harvesting for Bangladesh. So that's why it will be helpful for us to gain the knowledge and which we can use for uh, near future. Thank you. Yes. Uh, any response to that, please? Sonam, can you come in? I mean... I think I'll, I'll allow Karma to respond. On yeah, the pin please. Uh, you were talking about this uh, local manual to implement the project activity. Like local, uh, like the manuals which is developed for not people's like for uh, 
capacity building or awareness raising, which can be helpful for people to gather knowledge on how they will develop this system in their uh, local regions. There is any documentation or something like that, which will be helpful for us for research or something like that. Uh, just now, as such, we didn't, uh, uh, we don't have any local manual, uh, manual, but uh, we do have these reports and uh, visual documentation uh, that we have documented uh, for this uh, implementation. But uh, right. I think that we can uh, uh, make local, uh, prepare local manual, but uh, the uh, intervention uh, depends on sites, different sites. Okay. Uh, just, just to add on, I think we we um, forgot to mention about easy mode. So the spring shed con spring shed development concept is actually borrowed from the easy modes, the mm -hmm. six steps mode, the six steps um, mm -hmm. methods that they they have introduced. So if you're talking about spring shed, uh, that's what, what we have adopted. But like Karma said, you have to customize it to the needs of the community. All the communities right. have different geographical terrain, different environment. Yes. Got it. Yeah. That's sad that, I mean, uh, now uh, Karma was mentioning about project reports. Do you it's think bad. that uh, sharing project reports, uh, I don't know how... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it will get an idea. And also, uh, if I would like to visit Bhutan to see these interventions, then how I can contact with you? How to contact? Okay. <laughs> Who can answer me. that? Immigration <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> Oh, it's then not for the immigration, like uh, where we can contact with you. Like, we, uh, yeah, we uh, can leave our email address here on the chat box so you can write to us. Yeah. Okay, sure. okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shadat. Any, any more questions coming up from uh, today's webinar, or shall we go into the questions that have been already sent to us? Maybe we'll start uh, taking uh, the questions. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah, the question one is, how are Bhutan's traditional knowledge systems being integrated into modern nature-based solutions for water resource management? Anyone who can answer that, please? Any answers for that? Okay, may I? So, yeah, please. Uh, so there are uh, traditional techniques uh, such as stone budding. Uh, basically, we do stone budding for sustainable land management. So this is what uh, traditional technique they use to conserve water. And also terrace farming and country farming is, uh, is now being used for water conservation. And also the inclusion of this uh, traditional practice uh, such as uh, the culture the traditional culture and beliefs that, uh, that uh, we need to seek permission from local deities while implementing the project. Uh, and in the communities, is, in some of the communities, it is believed that uh, we should not cut trees near the water source uh, and all. And also uh, by this using the wooden uh, roots uh, for water harvesting and also this uh, Low cost uh, traditional uh, this water filtration. I think these are some Good. of the yeah. Okay, things. okay. Thank you. Uh, in fact, the second question also relates to something very similar to that. Are there specific examples of traditional practices that have been successfully incorporated into current initiatives? But I think that's that's what mm -hmm. you were mentioning, right? That's what you were trying to describe as well. Good. Anyway, the third question again on to you, Karma, because this is again on community engagement and ownership. What strategies are being employed to ensure local communities are actively involved in the design, implementation, and maintenance of nature-based solutions for water resources? I mean, that came up from your from your presentation itself, but uh, if you would like to uh, give us a very shortly short answer to that, please. So uh, basically, uh, we can this uh, uh, for this uh, 
uh, we uh, include the community member, uh, local government leaders in the early stage of the project development uh, through consultation and uh, these meetings and also uh, training, uh, training uh, and empowering the communities to take the ownership and by also forming this uh, water user group uh, to foster a sense of responsibilities uh, for the management and maintenance uh, of this uh, solution. I think this much. This yeah, much. thank you. I think I think that also answers the, the question number four, which say, uh, which asks uh, how how is community ownership and participation fostered in these initiatives? I mean, that's that's what you were what you were trying to explain uh, and uh, you know, Mr. Rajendra. Yeah, Can I yeah, add, please. add something yeah, to what yeah, Kama yeah. already said? Yeah. Go ahead. I think Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in this uh, whole process, um, you know, usually what happens is the communities are not aware of where their recharge potential recharge areas are. So any infrastructure development that happens uh, that could uh, have the potential of disturbing their water recharge area, they will not be aware. So in this process, because they were onboarded from day one. And after we've done the assessment, we went back to the community, we shared the findings, we showed them where the uh, recharge areas are. Henceforth, if, if there are any developmental activities that come in, they're able to tell them that this place should not be disturbed. Mm -hmm. So that's an empowerment uh, process that happens okay. uh, through the, through the uh, as, as we implement the activities. And, uh, one distinct uh, feature is uh, whatever Tarana does, there's no handing taking over. After the project is complete, we don't hand over to the communities because community has the ownership from day one. So this is again, something okay. very different from how things are done by others. So that way they know that it's theirs, it's not Tarana's, you know, should something break down, they have the capacity to fix it. Right, so they have the the skills. Uh, they are empowered empowered with knowledge and information, and uh, they have the ownership basically. So that actually leads to um, sustainability of the initiative. Just wanted to add that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Just just a question, uh, Sonam. Uh, you said that uh, from day one, I mean, the communities are involved, so they know that it's their own project. Um, in case of a, a, a repair or maintenance or something like that, do one question one is: Do you train also uh, somebody to take care of that? Yes, from the yes. community, one or two yes, people. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, and they form this water governance, right? The water yeah. user committee. So they have uh, another interesting feature is we have women who are office bearers of these water governance, these water user committee, and they also take responsibility of training the plumber, somebody yeah. with technical skills, so that they don't have to come looking for Tarayana after we phase out from the community. So all these are uh, parts and parcel of the process. Uh, I think it's it's just the Tarayana's uh, modest operandi where whatever we do, we make sure that you know communities take ownership, they're, they're empowered, their skills are we've imparted whatever skills and knowledge that is required. So we don't have to go back to them. They, they can do this on their own. So it's, in it's terms of, Yeah, in terms of material, I mean, in terms of material for any kind of uh, subsequent maintenance or repairs, I mean, do how, how do you get it? I mean, do you get it? Uh, I mean, is it a difficult process of getting access to material? In fact, uh, because it's a nature-based solution, we hardly use yeah. anything that is... Uh you know, okay. uh, imported, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Hardly anything is uh, imported. Okay. It's it's whatever locally available and they have a savings group mm -hmm. which they will use to do any kind of maintenance. Any further requirement, they will make use of their savings. So in this savings, they, they come to an agreement on how much would each household contribute monthly. And from there, they also make payment to this mm -hmm. uh plumber or whoever yeah. take charge of the technical aspects of the work and they make payment so that they they compensate uh, his time uh, to keeping everything intact yeah so and how many, how many women, yeah uh, okay how many women are involved in this whole process 
uh, women Karno. participation. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, during the process, we try to include uh, uh, if there, for example, if there uh, are ten households, uh, depending on one spring, uh, we engage uh, one one uh, this uh, household member mm -hmm. from this. Uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> household members. Uh, yes. Each household members engage, uh, and uh, uh, for this uh, power uh, uh, the this uh, in the water user group, the woman is uh, uh, this uh, treasurer. She is uh, yeah. the accountant of the water user group, and uh, when we implement this project, uh, many of the women were involved. Uh, involved in the, this construction of wooden tools and also this uh, collect how to collect the service water and harvest in this wooden tool and also this uh, build, uh, building of this wooden chamber and water filtration actually the way women uh, the, the woman is uh, the one woman is the treasurer of this water is a group yeah but we have many women here of saying uh, yeah, Mr. Rajendra, please. David, yeah. I would like to add what uh, whatever uh, to whatever my two colleagues yeah. have said about the community engagement. I think, yeah. uh, for Taran, I think you are building on the traditional uh, system of the community, uh, traditional system of the community engagement. Like we have a, in the traditional, we have uh, like uh, what people contribute their own voluntary uh, level. Yeah. to the community for any building like for instance for the water management we have a system in the villages where we call a traditional uh water water guard who actually protects the water mm -hmm. looks after the water management and then actually also looks after uh equal distributions and uh, distribution of water so building on those uh all those traditional uh, knowledge and system in the uh natural system of natural resource management it's not only in the water but also we have like uh, people who actually uh, guard the fire fire guards and also the mm -hmm. forest guards like local forest guards from the station so building on that uh, we engage uh, communities uh, and then also community have a system of uh, uh, voluntarily contributing the level and also that's why they, they take ownership and uh, yeah responsibility of managing their water resources and uh, that's the one way of uh, building a sustainable uh, uh, natural resource management system so based on the traditional system okay thank you very much uh, dr georgie uh, I think the fifth question, again, I think which we have been discussing right now here, the long-term sustainability. What measures are in place to ensure the long-term sustainability of nature-based solutions for water resource management in Bhutan? Are these plans, are there plans for adaptive management and monitoring to address potential challenges and change over time? Uh, I think the first part of the question we have been discussing, and I mean, uh, there's quite a good uh, understanding about how do you uh, how do you address the sustainability but in, on in terms of monitoring of what the projects after the project had been completed is there any kind of monitoring uh, that tariana uh, follows up with these projects uh, we do we do in fact um most of our projects would be 2 years and 3 years duration but we never completely phase out from any village right after mm -hmm. the completion of the project, because we know that in some, some cases, by the end of the project time, we won't even have seen the outcome of it. And Spring Shed is something similar, right? It took us some time to convince the communities uh, to, to, you know, for them to understand this concept, because you don't see the, the you know, impacts, outputs immediately. This is a long-term process. And uh, because of these reasons, we would always um, provide hand-holding support even after the project has ended. So as I mentioned earlier, we have field officers who live and work in these communities. So they would be constantly in touch. From the head office also, we have our monitoring. And I mentioned about the research center. So the research center also goes back to 
the communities we've served 10, 15 years ago, see how things have changed. Yeah. Should we change, you know, change our gear? Should we change our direction? You know, uh, do we continue as, as we've done in the past? So we have the research center for that purpose, but at the same time, we have our field officers and we do monitoring. On a, on a regular basis. But as, as I also mentioned, because we put all the systems in place while we are still there. So when we phase out, we, we don't get many requests from the community. They're good on their okay. own. They have this group, right? So we have, um, we've been doing water uh, management. Spring shed is a new concept. It's been only two, three years since it was introduced in Bhutan. But we've been doing water management at the water source level 15, 16 years ago where we formed water user committees. These water user committees are still functioning. They have their own savings. We don't have to support them. They're on their own. And uh, whatever maintenance is required, they use their savings. So I think it's it's the, the approach that we undertake where we uh, empower the communities while we're th still there. We just facilitate. We don't go and do the work by ourselves. So that actually... Um, you know, leads us not having to support them like, you know, regularly. So they're empowered and they can manage on their own in most cases. Good, good. What's the mode of communication? I mean, in case uh, these uh, communities in the hill areas, they want to contact uh, Tariana Foundation for whatever issues that come up. How do they communicate? I mean, I, I know it's, it's difficult to... Uh, you know, I mean, communication systems are difficult in the hill, hill terrain. How do they do it? Well, now, now we have a wide reach of uh, both mobile and internet. Okay. okay. I think in a, in a very short span of time, most of our, our remotest communities are connected to internet. Connected. So okay. WeChat, these social networks, WeChat okay. is very common. They have groups in the community. So it, it has made uh, our work a lot easier where we can even now um, do video conferencing with the communities, look at the progress of the work, especially during COVID okay. and the, the travel yeah. restriction time, we could you know, use these digital technologies. But it was not like that when we started working. When yeah. Tariana started working, we had to trek for three days mm -hmm. to reach some of our sites with literally no telephone, no internet, no electricity. So we can only send like a message from here one time, we cannot change our plan because people will be waiting for us and uh, there's no way we can cancel or postpone. So we have to make sure that we visit that village on that particular day. Yeah. Also, our, as our EG said before, we have the network of the field officers whom our communities can contact directly. So it's like unlike the other organizations. So we have an advantage of like uh, field officers where the communities can directly contact and uh, they get uh, support them or yeah, inform the headquarters. So this is the advantage for Tariana. Okay. Well, the next question is how to secure water resources for hill track communities. I think that's what we have been always discussing mm -hmm. right throughout. You know, uh, that's what exactly what Tariana is doing, trying to secure the water resources for for the sustenance of the track community, hill track community. So that that's okay. How to implement how to implement rainwater harvesting in urban areas? Mm -hmm. Any 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 uh, <laughs> response on that? We're talking about we've not area. done rainwater in the urban areas. Yeah. We've, we've done think... in rural, but yeah, the technique is same. I think okay. not very different. Just that in the rural communities, their community believes. You know where some communities, uh, you know they they cannot drink rainwater. It's mm -hmm. against their belief system. So there are challenges like that that we have to encounter. But I think in terms of system, it's the same. I, I don't know if there's any other system mm -hmm. from putting the cutter and mm -hmm. you know having the tanks in place. But you I said it's interesting. very Sorry. interesting. You said people's belief that they should not drink rainwater, is it? Yes, it's there's one particular community in the south where they have water issues and we were promoting rainwater harvesting. Yeah. And um they they said it's it's against their belief system that you know they can drink rainwater. Then we said if you cannot drink, then use it for your field, mm -hmm. for your kitchen mm -hmm. garden, for your toilet. You don't drink, but use it for those purposes. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So it's it's like these are some of the challenges which you may not see it at the surface, but when you you know interact yeah. with the communities, work closely yeah. with the communities, then there are these issues that exist. I think for now for Bhutan, I think the rainwater harvesting in the urban areas particularly very new. I think, uh, but then I think we probably need an uh, infrastructure development for that, and also a lot of uh, capacity and uh, uh, the awareness on that. But if you can do that, I think we would be able to solve a lot of uh, flash flood issues or sewage. We, especially in the monsoon, we face a lot of. Uh, Lot of overflow of uh, rainwater from the drain because of the uh, storm water that uh, we could not uh, mm -hmm. really uh, harvest or uh, control. So I think uh, this could be a potential uh, future project that we can look forward. But I think for now we are not very I think advanced with the rainwater harvesting in the urban areas. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, Sadat, is it? Uh... Is it come originating from your side? How how to build infrastructure for effective rainwater harvesting in Bangladesh? I mean, we are talking to three experts from Bhutan. Uh, <laughs> any, <laughs> I don't know where it originated from. The question: How do you do it in Bangladesh? Sadat, are you still there? No, she is not there. Okay. Anyway, so we'll uh, yeah. I think this question is not from my part, I think. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, because I was a bit curious because all three presenters are from Bhutan and we're asking a question from Bangladesh about Bangladesh. Maybe the next webinar we can uh, we can address that right. question. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the next, next, I think next two, uh, next one is the, on GIS. Be used as a collaborative tool in this process. Do you use GIS as a Tool, right? Oh, mm -hmm. karma can. Yeah, yeah uh, karma. Come on. Oh uh, yes, we do use uh, GIS uh, yeah. to, uh, for mapping these water resources uh, uh, to visualize data, and uh, also uh, we use uh, GIS for stakeholder collaborations when we uh, this map or water resources and also potential recharge area. We use GIS. And uh, uh, we present to stakeholder uh, to visual reference, and also uh, uh, we use for uh, GIS to this, uh, uh, allocate resources, uh, optimize resource allocation by identifying the area of need. Uh, then we also uh, we can also use uh, GIS for this uh, decision making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, GIS has been used for all in all process like uh, planning, starting okay. a very useful tool. Yep. Where we yep. really use the GIS, and also uh, we are developing a GIS database where, like, we can like we have been talking about the monitoring in the future, where like uh, using all those uh, the current uh, data, uh, whatever interventions we are making. So from those data and also future. Uh, data is that we can keep on monitoring the the progress and uh, impacts and also the future uh, changes. So yeah, GIS is a very useful tool yep. that we always use. Okay, thank you very much. I think the last question again, I mean, we have already addressed this because how can traditional knowledge be integrated into modern water management practices, which we did address already. So I think uh, that comes to the end of uh, the question that have been posted to us before uh, before we started the webinar today. Uh, uh, Tanuja and uh, Danushi, any anything else or? There's one you... question in the chat. Yeah, please, Mr. Rajendra, maybe. Is there a question on. in the chat? Yes, one. it says, "Did you check uh, quality of water for human oh. consumption?" I think yes, we check yes. the water for quality for him. As I like presenting in the end of my slide, so I just returned uh, uh, last night from the field. Uh, yeah, it's like in the southern uh, Bhutan. Like this is just an example that uh, we are doing. So I just presented in that. Uh, so we checked 
if the water is uh, drinkable and uh, what are the 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 factors that are like impacting the quality and quantity so whenever we do uh, uh, this uh, spring shape or the the uh, the works on the actually we were actually working on the payment of environmental services because uh, for the sustainable uh, uh, management and supply of water to the urban areas and rural areas like uh, so where the local, rural communities manage manage the water uh, resources or the watershed areas and then the urban people can uh, pay some fees to the rural community. So these are also some of the initiatives uh, that are currently taking. And uh, based on that, I think uh, one of the yeah, initiatives we always take is like to check the water quality. If the water is drinkable for or uh, usable for human consumption, if not, what are the factors that are affecting the water quality? So these are uh, yeah, taking care. But what are what are the what are the factors that affect water quality? Because it's I mean all what I, I have think, seen is such pristine water. Uh yeah, as I was saying, like uh, just cite an example from where I visited the sun. Uh, sorry, uh, doctor. Uh, sorry, if you can show Tachi, your slides didn't show up after the video. Oh okay. So we didn't see any of the slides after the video. So if you can oh. just. Put it up, okay. the last and what kind of testing we do. Yeah, I think you can continue talking in the interest of time. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I didn't know that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, just like uh, we just returned from the, like I uh, like we just returned from the field and then we measure different aspect of the water. So like we measure the pH, the carbon uh, uh, dissolve, uh, and then also different uh, yeah the nitrogen content and the uh, different uh, yeah ni nitric ammonia content all those and then based on that uh, we just uh, this is preliminary findings and if we if you find that the, the water is uh, more contaminated also we do the bacterial test uh, yeah so and then if you find that water is uh, more contaminated then we take the sample and take it take the water sample to the lab for further further testing and uh, analysis so this is yeah. This 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 was uh, actually uh, just done one day, one day like on Saturday we did a test in one of the area where we did uh, measured all this, uh, yeah, indicators. Okay. Uh, can you guys see that? Yeah. And Doctor Ra and Mr. Rajendra's question was, what what are the factors, Anilo, contributing oh, to yeah. the contamination? So. So, uh, if I cite the example from this one, yeah, the, the uh, this water was not uh, we recommended is not very safe for drinking because they have uh, the settlement above the water, the water source, and then they have also the the sewage and the the uh, the, okay. the, okay. the uh, waste uh, dumping areas above, and also the the uh, the floor. Whenever there's a rainfall, that the storm water flows into the system, so the water is uh, somewhat contaminated. So that's why, like, uh, these are the factors. And also, in some areas, we have like uh, livestock and other uh, livestock grazing or human like overflow from the agriculture fields in some parts of the uh, uh, countries. Like we have found that, and some people like use excessive uh, pesticides or uh, the uh, fertilizers and then those uh, overflow into the into the water systems and uh, so some yeah these are some of the factors that are uh, affecting the quality of the water but have you have you noticed uh, bacterial contamination in water e coli and such yeah, 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 yeah 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 so we did that test and uh, yeah and then it was found and so uh, after doing all those things, then if you if you think there's uh, these waters are uh, not good, we actually take the sample and do further tests in the labs. So. Yeah. Okay. Good.
anything else danushree i think uh, uh, rajendra there was another yeah. question another, from another Arun. question just yeah, somebody about somebody just consumption somebody just of water up. from rainwater harvesting system in rural areas does it imply to rainwater harvesting systems consumption of water from rainwater harvesting system in rural areas does it implies to rainwater harvesting systems what does that mean i think the testing no do we consumption do we of rainwater test? probably do this we... means that whether that you test rainwater uh, yeah yeah something with the i think uh, probably mean? uh as i was presenting the most of the source for drinking water in the town mm -hmm. is from the spring water and i think uh, of course the springs are uh, rain fed and probably but then also i think uh, in only some villages if i'm not wrong but uh, we use the rain water harvesting for drinking or most probably for the agriculture purposes only and uh, i think uh, yeah i don't but know in your that, yeah that was the question i think so but in your in your in your opinion uh, dr doji i mean which water source is better spring water or rainwater harvesting from <laughs> roofs or which in um, terms of quality in terms of quality i think for bhutan if you can really manage the springs and also with a with bit of a community mobilization yeah. like a, uh, spring water is best because that's why we are actually implementing the payment of environmental services where we really wanted to actually that actually uh, serves both with like a uh, uh, win-win situation where like uh, we also contribute towards the environment conservation where like people uh, take a responsibility or ownership to manage the watershed and the biodiversity around them mm -hmm. as well as supply of good quality and also the water users actually uh, makes contribute some payment to the rural communities where like uh, so uh, I think uh, that I would say the rainwater harvesting or rainwater use would be the last option that Bhutan would opt if there's no other so uh, spring water source we can use or uh, spring uh, the water source from the stream but uh, yeah okay any more yes Hang go um, ahead Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, talking about water in Bhutan, of course, is uh, something that uh, is a bit tricky because the water comes from rain and it used to come from snow melt. And um, in many instances, uh, the water was contam contaminated. So we do have some problems. The picture that uh, Dr. Georgi was just showing also shows the issue and he was telling the story. There was a community upstream or higher up and they were not having proper sanitary facilities or whatever the case may have been and therefore contaminating downstream water. So this is a very common, common issue. I think there's still a lot of awareness raising necessary to, uh, to make people understand that subsequent communities are also going to suffer from uh, their habits. Um, from that perspective, uh, I was showing a little earlier uh, a little picture, an old one from Bhutan, of course, the traditional, uh, this is uh, existing maintenance schedules or manuals that were made once upon a time by the Ministry of Health and UNICEF a long time ago. But of course, those type of practices, I understand in between the words that uh, what people have been saying are also being, uh, I mean, Tariana Foundation also has similar kind of guidance material for the people in the, in the communities. And I think that is something that needs to be further uh, emphasized, expanded, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the presentation of the uh, current, since a few years, uh, work happening on nature-based solutions that is very encouraging. Uh, at the same time, of course, this is something what people somehow used to do, except in some instances, I suppose, that maybe we're 
uh, they're looking too much towards the local government and uh, asking them to support. Whereas, in fact, these are questions that local communities, I mean, these little hamlets will have to take care of themselves. And that was a question I had with respect to Tarayana. Is Tarayana uh, looking at the outside communities, those that cannot be served directly by the government programs? How does it work? Um, of course, it is very commendable that you do so. At the same time, of course, there will be a limit. Ultimately, the communities, including the uh, local government, will have to take care of whatever water sources and water systems are functional within the Gewok. So that is something that will have to come up. And uh, the the problem, I mean, I'm, I'm basically uh, from the other side, from Nepal. Uh, so the problem that we faced in Nepal is that also in quite a number of instances, uh, there are less young people in the community. There are old people in the community, but the younger people have moved to the towns. And that makes it more difficult to maintain the uh, the systems. Uh, so th there are all kinds of issues there that uh, one needs to uh, take care of. I'm very happy to hear that you're monitoring. You're monitoring in two ways, by persons, people going there, and of course, by uh, making an occasional uh, SMS or WhatsApp or whatever communication you may have. That is, of course, extremely important because it kind of encourages people to look after the systems. It is not easy to look after the systems in Bhutan because I've experienced myself while living in Bhutan that, you know, in a good number of instances, you find after the rainy season that a number of spring sheds have been damaged. Uh, washouts, uh, I mean, uh, and you have to restore, you have to rebuild, and you're looking for a good spot where to rebuild because it is not always the same place that is possible to rebuild. So it's it's a difficult thing, but therefore it is quite critical that the local community is engaged because they know how the watershed changes over the year and they can advise. Uh, one of the things that, that we used to ask in Nepal was always the old people. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, how was it? What did you do? What did your father do? And I think there's a lot of uh, knowledge that is still there that can be gained from that and good practices that they used to have in order to sustain their water sources. It's not going to be easy, but at least Bhutan still has water. So if you are doing this nature-based solutions, infiltrating, infiltration of water, as was shown in uh, the, last, uh, the last presentation, then I think you are able to move ahead uh, nicely. The question then also is, you, uh, it was said that you're only doing this for about three years. That's good. So now you have to start looking at what the effects are slowly. And then also make sure that you can share that knowledge with others within Bhutan, because the government is doing all kinds of projects. Uh, that is true. But some of the projects are exactly the same projects that you are doing. Uh, it's not always big engineering stuff. It is just small, small interventions. And they need to learn. They need to see how it works and what you can do by engaging the community and sustaining that community engagement for a long time. Thank you. And uh, my appreciation to Tarayana Foundation. Thank you very much, Hang. I think we have almost come to our time now. It's uh, almost five o'clock. Uh, unless Danushi has something else to say. Anything more, Danushi? Yes, so um, I think... Uh... It has been interesting. There's some small token for all our members, uh, which I would like to share before we uh, end the session. And that uh, we have been uh, <clears throat> sharing this on live stream is also available on uh, uh, Sanet Facebook. Uh, we will also be uploading it to YouTube, uh, Sanit YouTube channel. So uh, Tarayana can also share that and the others who are present can uh, revisit and uh, 
find like find out more information and then get back to Tarayana uh, and connect as a Shahadat. Uh, like there could be others like Shahadat who wanted more information, more insights. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, thank you uh, for being with, uh, for joining the webinar series of Sanit and uh, making a 15th webinar of Sanit successful. So look forward to continued collaboration with Tarayana Foundation. Yeah, uh, Rajinder, you want to add anything? Yeah. Yeah. And Tanuja also. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you very much uh, to all three presentation presenters. And it was really nice, very nice to discuss what's happening in Bhutan. And I really love it. You know, thank you very much. Yeah, Tanuja. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rajendra. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you, Tarana Foundation, for uh, the wonderful presentation and insight to your uh, country and your water resources and your projects. Uh, it was, as Rajendra says, really wonderful to hear it all. and. Thank you for connecting with us again, although you have been uh, with us for some time. I think it's the first chance we had a uh, chance to share what has been happening there. So hopefully we will, uh, in the future, we can collaborate together um, and um, share much more many things uh, with the others as well. So thanks again. And... Uh, uh, Everybody, namaste, everyone. And thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. 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 See you. See you. Right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.